Kev's Fails Journey. Andrea is working on her High Performance Leadership Project in Toastmasters. Her goal is to videotape this beginning 12 to 15 minute interview. That's words like Gail today. Ms. Nightingale is known as the mother of modern nursing. Tonight, Ms. Nightingale shares her personal experience with pain, which transitions into a historical overview of the history of anesthesia by Ms. Nightingale. The last portion of this project, where a modern nurse explains the current understanding of pain transmission, will not be part of tonight's presentation, but is mentioned at the end. Andrea is working on clarity and flow of complex ideas and would like feedback on these ideas. Again, Andrea is working on clarity and flow of complex ideas and would like feedback in these areas. Please welcome Andrea. I'm so privileged to sit beside an historic icon today. Miss Florence Nightingale, you will recall, is referred to as the mother of modern nursing. She went to the front lines during the Crimean War in Russia and proved that women could survive in war times. She flourished as a change agent afterwards, not only in England and India, but around the world. Her historical perspective helps us understand how far humans have come regarding pain management through time. I would like to welcome Ms. Nightingale to the studio. Tell me, how did you first become interested in the sick poor and their plight for better care? Well, thank you. I appreciate this moment. Um, maybe it's easier to explain things a little bit over here. As you see, a lot of time has gone on from my uh, time, 1850, to your time. So these are two separate maps to kind of show you the differences. And I was raised in England, and my family traveled all throughout Europe. And as you see, these, these tags show all the different places that my family and I would travel. Now, my father was a very intelligent man and did teach me to speak five different languages fluently. So I speak English, French, Italian, Greek, a little bit of German couple other languages, but those are the main ones. So as we would travel, I had no problem talking to people in different parts of the different cities. And I would ask them, how did you take care of the sick poor? Where do you get your bread from? Who brings you blankets? And these are the type of questions that I would ask no matter where I was. And I would write down everybody's response. And then I started categorizing. What are they doing in Paris? What are they doing in Germany? And then I started to look for this differences and what was the same and so I basically created what you might call a database. As I got older I became more interested in specific nursing and nurses training because there really wasn't nurses training. Now I did find a place in uh, Germany here who the sisters would actually do a very good job training the other sisters in the, ho the hospitals and before they sent them out in the countryside. So that was in Kaiserwerth, Germany. So I did go there just to kind of view what are they doing, how are they doing, and I brought back some of these ideas back with me to London. Now that was in my tw late 20s. Now by 30, there was a war that broke out in Crimea, which is a southern piece of uh, Russia here, and the Russians were pushing into the Ottoman Empire. And so, uh, uh, England and France, we helped the, um, the Ottoman Empire out. And so that's kind of a, a little bit about my history. So I was always interested in the sick poor along the way. That's very interesting. So the Crimean War occurred in 1854 when Russia invaded the Ottoman Empire. And as you said, the Allies, France, and England helped out. This was when France still helped other countries out. What did you do when you arrived? Well, I organized the supplies. Um, there was no uh, clean men. They, they sat in their dirty uniforms with uh, blood on them. And so I really started to clean them up. Uh, they were sleeping on the floors. I wanted them to sleep up off the ground. Um, 
and also their diet. I was noticing that the senior officers were getting the meat and vegetables in the broth and the soldiers were just getting the broth. And so I thought, well, let's split that up. And so every other day I made sure that one group or the other group all got meat and vegetables. So I split up how everyone was being cared for. And so basically my focus was to improve the balanced diet and balance their chain of supplies so that there was a flow to everyone getting what they needed. I understand you also became known as the lady with the lamb for doing nightly rounds checking on soldiers. This was the first war that the newspapers covered in real time. Newspapers reported your outstanding work. And by the time you came back home to England, you were famous. Tell us, what was that like? Yeah. Well, I did coordinate a lot of the care, and the newspapers started to cover this information. And they covered it in real time. So they weren't just covering what the Army told them to cover. They were actually covering um, what was occurring. And not only did they cover that, but also the letters that I sent home to my family, they also sent them to the newspapers. So they were also published. So not only did I have a lot of reports of what was going on in Crimea, but also my family locally. And so when I came home, yes, you're right, I was quite famous. Um, and they did uh, give me a, a large sum of money of which I started the first nursing school with. Interesting. I also understand that you contracted Crimean fever, which is a relapsing, remitting fever that affected your spinal cord and made you bedbound for many months at a time and at, for one, at one point for over a year. How did you find the strength to continue your plight for the educated nurse? Well, you know, to be honest with you, God spoke to me when I was 16 years old, and he told me I was going to do something really important, although he never said exactly what. So this was always in the back of my mind, um, and when I came home, yes, I was quite sick with Crimean fever, and I, I had a lot of pain in my spine. In fact, there were two separate times where I thought that I was going to die at any moment. Um, fortunately, I did not. But I have to say, it did throw me into a very large depression, not only because of pain that I was dealing with all the time, but also that the Army had basically lied about the number of men who died and why. And so this threw me into kind of a, 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 a struggle <coughs> within myself. And I believe God's strength held me through because what I ended up doing is writing to the head of the army and explaining to them what the numbers actually were, why did I think some of the men died, and, and so this kind of created the army having to really relook at what they were doing and how they were reporting information and statistics, mortality statistics. And I understand you wrote prolifically to administrators, politicians, people with influence and money. You also wrote two nursing books. Your influence ended up being huge for the Civil War, India, and your letters were shared worldwide. Tell me, why are you focused on pain management? Well, as I said, I suffered with Crimean fever, so the subject itself is near and dear to me. But also, I looked at the soldiers suffering and when they needed amputations, they weren't always given just the basic anesthetic whatsoever. Um, there was one main uh, physician who felt like that they should just grit and bear it and that that would make them more of a man, and I just didn't agree with that. Um, so these were some of the things why I've been watching and paying attention to pain, and you know, I struggled every single day with it for the rest of my life. So I mean, this is a big issue for me. Mm, that makes sense. So please tell us all, historically, what was available for pain back in time? Well, historically, if you look back in the beginning of time, really there were only herbal remedies available. But shortly thereafter, uh, there was alcohol available in Mesopotamia. And about the 8th century, we actually started to get opium. So that's kind of basically, we've had those three for, for quite some time. And in England, actually, in 1200, we used something called Diwale. And Diwale was a mixture of uh, lettuce, hemlock, and um, a couple other things, and opium, and bile. 
And what we didn't understand is that the hemlock interacted with the other ingredients and actually uh, most people passed away and died before they woke up. But on the off chance that they would wake up, what, we would do, what they would do back in those days is take salt and vinegar and rub it on their face to wake them up. This wasn't maybe the best choice back in 1200. But in 1275, ether was actually discovered. Okay, ether is actually good, but it really wasn't utilized until about 1540, when uh, Valerius Cordus was able to distill it with um, ethanol and ammonia and found that there were some actual medicinal value to that. Was there any improvement during, say, the Renaissance period between 1350 and 1550? I heard that Michelangelo began drawing anatomy and physiology so surgeons would actually know what to expect once they opened you up. <laughs> That's true. Michelangelo did uh, get very interested in dissecting um, patients after they passed away so that he could draw pictures of the muscles. And you're right, before that they didn't really know what was inside. Uh, most of his uh, pictures are actually missing, but it, you'll find parallels in Renaissance in all the anatomy picture books of all his work. Um, but surgery still remained the last resort. Most patients would prefer to die at, from whatever their affliction was before that they would have surgery because there really weren't very good choices even then. I don't know. It, you know, as I said, there, either I can't see this though. <laughs> um, let's see. As I said, ether started to gain a lot of interest during the Renaissance. Um, partially um, because in the 1540s we found that it actually had medicinal properties. Um, and so ether was starting to be used more and more. And then also uh, nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, was starting to also be used during the Renaissance period. And Little by little, people started to experiment early on with these things, even though we didn't really know what properties they actually had, but people did start to uh, do some experimenting. Well, I heard there was something from the ether called an ether frolic. What is that? Frolicking sounds like it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, ether frolics were, um, a large audience would gather, and the people from the audience would volunteer to come up on stage, the brave souls would come up on stage, and either they would inhale the ether or they would inhale laughing gas, to, much to the chagrin of the entire audience who watched the antics going on on stage. This was a huge amount of entertainment for people. Until one day, someone running around on stage actually hurt their leg. And the man did not notice that his leg was bleeding, and he was really bleeding pretty badly until after the ether, felt, the ether effects wore off. So this is when they started to realize that maybe there are some medicinal properties that could be utilized a little bit more so. Well, how did we improve from there? Um, so that was in the middle periods. We really didn't have a big jump until 1800. And in 1800, um, we were able to isolate morphine from opium. And that was uh, named after the Greek god, uh, um, Morpheus. So when you think of morphine, think of the Greek god of sleep, which is Morpheus. And so we had morphine in 1800, um, and we had a little bit more improvement on the use of ether. One of the things we did do at that point was um, same thing like the audience, and a man who was a uh, Boston music teacher volunteered to go up on stage to have his tooth extracted in front of everyone um, watching, and he used ether, and when he awoke, he said he never had any pain. And so then they thought, oh, this actually does work. Wow. And uh, I heard that uh, there was uh, something around that time with chloroform. Yeah, there was a Scottish obstetrician who uh, started to use chloroform with um, obst obstetric women. Um, and originally what they did is they used a closed system. So it was a mask, it was a, a closed mask that was connected to a hose to a bottle of chloroform. The only problem with that is that they really couldn't adjust the amount. And so a few patients died that way. 
But a little while later, they came up with a better system, which was more like a drop system, where you would take just a, gen a, a general mask, and then you would take the chloroform, drop it on, and then the patient would be able to inhale the chloroform along <coughs> with regular air. And that actually worked out quite well, because then people would be slightly pain-free, or, or pain-free, and yet still be able to react. And this was very important with the obstetric women, because um, the women could be pain-free during labor, but yet they could still help push the baby out. So that became a huge improvement in time. And that's ultimately what, what was being used when I was born. And wasn't there some royalty that got involved with this? Is, isn't that how it became popular? Yeah, actually, um, Queen Victoria uh, was pregnant with her eighth child, and her husband pleaded with the doctors, please give my wife something for this labor. And he pleaded and he pleaded, and though the doctors were very reluctant, they did ultimately agree that they would use this open method of chloroform for her while she was in labor. And lo and behold, Prince Leopold was born just fine, and Queen Victoria herself was just fine also. So that's when chloroform became more common for average people? Um, yes, yes. Um, the, the only thing i got to tell you about the uh, open method is we did find out later that it was actually toxic to your heart and your, and your liver, which is probably why you don't use that anymore. Oh, well, I see that we've come a long way since... Uh, the past, and we have many more options for labor and delivery. Yes. Um, so to summarize with the anesthetics that are available, in the early years we had cannabis and alcohol and opium, and then in the middle years we had a lot of problem with ether and trying to distill it correctly in the 12 to 1500 range, and then around 1800 we actually started blossoming and making more things available, one being morphine was isolated, and two, chloroform actually in this open method was a much better choice, although like I said, not exactly perfect, and laughing gas was also being used. So by the time the Crimean War came about, the best choice that we had was chloroform, and that was basically the preferred method. So I hope you have a little bit better idea of the history of anesthetics, um, and also, not only the history of anesthetics, but my plight for pain management and why it's so in, um, important to me. And to appreciate the trials and tribulations that our forefathers went through to be able to fully sleep in the 21st century, because this was not normal in the 1850s by any means. Now we have an understanding of your life, your passion, and your personal experience with pain. Thank you for visiting and explaining the first feeble attempts of pain management for us today. If you want additional information, you may be interested in the following video of a modern nurse presenting more specific information on the physiology of pain. You may also visit Ms. Nightingale's website at the website located at the bottom of your screen. We hope you tune in again, and we'll see you again real soon. Thank you. evaluations of Ms. Nightingale's speech. I'd like to first start with Bob Roman, who will be covering the content of the speech. Hello, Toastmasters guests, and of course, uh, Florence. Florence, I really enjoyed your talk. You gave us a part of history. Your lessons with the map were very good. Uh, I noticed you had a nice cheat, cheat seat, <laughs> sheet there. Uh, that was good. You spoke very clearly and competently. The person who was, Virginia, who was interviewing you asked distinct questions, and that's always good. Is if you're going to be interviewed, write the questions you're going to be interviewed, and then you'll know it for sure. But there were some things that says for clarity and then the flow. The cheat, well, your cheat sheet should have been a little bit bigger. 
because in the beginning part you were doing it really good, but then towards the end over there, then maybe it got down to the lower part. Yeah. And maybe I would suggest putting the cheat sheet here that you could be facing your interviewer mm. because basically you were being interviewed, you weren't on television. If you were on television, the camera would be over here and you get your picture, but you were looking at the camera this way. Well, some of the things that I have, uh, I wasn't sure if this speech was about Florence Nightingale, uh, at least I thought in the beginning it was, but then you talked about a history of pain management and anesthetics. And if it was, then I don't really know if Florence Nightingale had to be involved in this if you're going with the history of everything because your part was a significant part, but it was only a small part of history. So in that sense, I like the Florence Nightingale I would have liked more in the speech telling me about how you started the School of Nursing and what you got involved there. You, you mentioned too that you went to Germany and you got information from the nuns, but you never shared any information you got from the nuns to us. That again would be tuning your own horn. I would have liked to see more of that and a little bit less of the of what they did in the in the ages, uh, and you mentioned you were depressed because you had the sickness, and then the army lied to you about how these men died. That was the first time you brought that up. It would have been good to build up to that point and mention that in your in your talks, and you found out you were getting different answers from uh, different people. Again, maybe when you're going to different countries, that could have been one of the questions you asked, how are these people were dying and so forth. But it was very good. It's always good to see someone take the extra mile, go in a costume and do it. Uh, you were believable as Florence Nightingale, but I'd like to hear more about Florence Nightingale and not the rest of the uh, paid management. Thank you, Bob. And now for the delivery, I'd like to invite Nick up. Thank you, Madam Toastmasters, fellow Toastmasters guests, especially. Andrea, a.k.a. Florence Nightingale. So, Andrea, there were a lot of things that I thought you did really well tonight, and I'd like to start with those. I'd, I'd like to first congratulate you, because I think um, you wore the best costume ever in Top Toastmasters. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Uh, I thought you used props really well. I, I liked your poster board. Um, you used a mask. Uh, about a quarter, halfway through your presentation. Uh, what really stuck out to me about your delivery is, uh, as Bob mentioned, there was a clearness to it. There was a confidence. It seems like you've studied um, Florence Nightingale before, and there was an assurance and a clearness and a confidence to your voice that was evident throughout the entire speech, and I, I think it kept us engaged. Um, in terms of the appropriateness, I liked it because I think you can got, go a lot of different directions. In addition to Toastmasters, I just jotted down some uh, doctors, nurses, professors, teachers, students. So I think a lot of people can benefit from this. Um, some things that I, I uh, made me to think about in terms of improvement, um, since the kind of um, one of the points of, of the presentation was pain, I think you could have had a little bit more fun with uh, vocal variety um, because I think uh, you know pain can make some funny noises and I think you could have had some fun because the other thing that I would have liked to have seen is history sometimes works best when it's interactive um, so if you can kind of use screeches and growls and just pains that sounds that people make when they are faced with pain I think it'll keep people engaged 
And I think history works well when it's, when it's interactive. So instead of pulling out the mask, maybe call up a volunteer and put the mask on them. Mm -hmm. But going back, because you asked us to focus on clarity and flow, uh, this is probably the, the most, uh, the thing I would like to see improved upon the most is organization and, and pace. And I think the first question um, kind of revealed that. And, and what I mean is, um, Virginia asked you, the question went along the lines of, how did you get into nursing? And you have a lot of knowledge, but you immediately jumped to the PowerPoint, or not the PowerPoint, I'm sorry, the poster board. And you gave us a lot of information. Um, give it to us, um, not spoon-fed, but just a little bit slower, because I wrote down so many things you talked about. Um, involvement in war, your time in England, being famous, death, depression, you were a diplomat, you were an author, you had the Crimean fever, you talked about Michelangelo, that's a lot of information. And with overload, sometimes you, you, it doesn't sink in. So I would say a little bit more organization, a lot slower pace, and I think that, that the knowledge that you're presenting to us, that you obviously know will kind of sink into the audience. But other than that, I, I really enjoyed it, and I look forward to your next speeches. Thanks, Nick. And now I'd like to open it up to our round robin. And want to start with um, John? Want to start? Um, yeah. But I really don't want to start with John. I found it fascinating to learn what Florence Nightingale's role really was, um, but I didn't understand the whole goal for this presentation. I gathered that it's that what we saw was the first part of maybe a longer presentation, and it might have been really helpful for us to know more about the overall goal and how this fit in, because I sensed that there was, I think at least a few of us probably misunderstood why we were getting the balance, the proportion of information that we got uh, about Florence's life and the history of, of pain management. Um, I didn't see that then you have that sense of how the content fit together as well as I would have liked. So do you think maybe more of a present, like an intro? In your intro, you could explain what your purpose was. Okay. This is uh, a part of, this is, you know, 10 minutes of this and what are you going to be using it for? If it's going to be used for work, okay. if it's going to be because I didn't, yeah, I didn't understand why it's being called an HPL. Because it was a speech, an, inter an interview. I didn't see the whole picture, so I didn't really see how it fit in to an HPL project. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think you could have put it in your intro, like you know, John had said, to explain it. Mm -hmm. John, did you have any other? No. Let's, let's move on. Uh, Um, what I think you can improve upon is what I can improve upon the most in my speeches, and, and that is uh, flatness. You were in battle. You smelled the sweetness of the blood flowing on the ground. You saw the terror in the eyes of the people who are having amputations, who are dying, they're calling for their mother. And you were a woman in a place that these doctors did not want you. Thank you. And if everyone could just give, you know, one, one point that she could improve on. Did you have something? Um, I'm not a particular uh, fan of his story, but uh, I was really captivated by the whole story of it all, and it really got me interested in listening to the story of Florence Nightingale. So I, I really like that part of it. Nick, uh, you 
have a quick suggestion. I think one thing to make the questioning back and forth maybe seem more realistic, you might want to write a question and have a real short answer and then kind of bounce back to the questioner to say, well, what do you mean by that? Or some, like a natural interviewer, sometimes they ask you the question and then you bounce back to kind of have a little banter and then have the longer question, and kind of a short answer and then a long one. Question come up maybe a different pace. Jerry? It's, it's interesting Ted mentioned that because one of the things I had written down, uh, and it's already been mentioned in the beginning, is that I found that, Andrea, you were speaking really, really fast. Your pacing was, you're, you're firing off those words, boom, 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 boom. And then, as Ted just said, I would agree to make it more conversational because I, I made it a note, it almost sounded like a recital because I know you were looking at, you know, Bob mentioned your cheat sheet, mm -hmm. but at points it just seemed like instead of you being engaged with Virginia interviewing you, it wasn't a give and take that you were just kind of like reciting words and you were, you know, sticking to the script yeah. and almost like reading it, where if you're looking at, you know, the, the camera that's being recorded or even to the audience mm -hmm. to be more engaged with them, to be more connected with them. Because as, you know, you look down any number of times and grammatically, I stopped counting the number of ums and ahs. <laughs> it was peppered. My favorite. It, yes, it was peppered. I just stopped because it was multiples. Uh, but in terms of the presentation itself, I, 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 like Roger, found it very interesting. And I thought, wow, this woman's done a whole lot. But also, to Bob's point, I would like to hear more about Florence Nightingale in the speech because you're talking about history and pain management and going through all these different circumstances. But I wanted to, I wanted to know more about Florence and her connection with those events, more in detail. Mm -hmm. Virginia? I, I agree with Ted. I, I think that we could alter the, the questions and break it up a little bit more. It would be a little, a little more natural and might be a little bit easier for you and you wouldn't have to rely on the notes. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, and then I just want to add a quick thing that you're kind of, you were more conversational when you were sitting. When you went to the map, it was like you were on speed. <laughs> so pause more with, within the ideas because you're just, just going blah, 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 blah. So pause, especially more when you were talking about the map. You were more conversational when you were sitting. And then when you were sitting, if you weren't speaking, you were looking down instead of at the audience. So those are my only comments. And um, so great. If I can just add one thing, Andrea, to eliminate the ahs and the ums, what, what you're doing is when you're speaking, you keep your, you have your mouth open and thinking your next thought. Once you complete a sentence, close your mouth and don't open it until you're going to say another sentence. If you learn that way, the only way you can say ah or um, and you keep your mouth open, maybe you look up a... Uh, you can't, you can't make an eye or um with your mouth closed. Think of a period. You're putting a period at the end of the sentence. All right, our next speaker. Hang on. <laughs>